think I took the going down. You can put it by the door. Thank you. Put it on this side. Sergio Botero. Sergio Botero. Two names. One, one full name. Oh, no. Sergio is my name. Botero oh, is last name. Okay, last name. Okay. No. Oh, good. Uh, one quick question. I know you mentioned at the beginning of the year, but the other option to take the final exam is one. 16, 10 to 12. Perfect. Thank you. Morning. Okay, if you, did, if you hadn't picked up your exams by Friday evening, I took it into my office because otherwise over the weekend there's a chance that they get recycled because the guy's coming and doing a cleaning up. You know. So if you haven't picked up your exam, you need to come into my office to pick it up. There are about, I would say at least 40 exams, 35. I know based on history that 20 never will get picked up. And the same 20 will not get picked up on quiz two and quiz three as well. I guess you're following the principle that what you don't know can't hurt you, <laughs> which is not a good idea in valuation, but uh, hey, whatever rings your bell. Um, so today we're going to actually kind of complete the process of valuation, right, of, of discounted cash flow valuation, first by talking about how to pick the right model to value your company. So as we go through that first phase, I want you to think about your company, and if you cannot think about what your company's name is, 
You've got some work to do, right? Because remember, that well, this was your first try at a discounted cash. Actually, I've had two already turned in the DCFs, so you don't have to wait till that Friday, and I've returned those two back. So if you send it in now, you're going to get it back 20 minutes later. You're done. Check done, you can move on. So the sooner you get it to me, because on that Friday, if you send it at 5 o'clock, then it's going to get stacked up. There'll probably be about 100 that come in at 5, and I have to work sequentially. I'll try to get through as quickly as I can. But if you want quick feedback, if you can send it in before that deadline, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, or even today, or tomorrow, I'll try to get it back as soon as I can. Again, remember, it's not for grading. It's really for my, you know, I look over your evaluation and say, hey, maybe you might want to tweak this. Do you think about this? What's your story? It's really about stress testing what you're trying to do with your company. So as I said, today we're going to talk about finishing up discounted cash flow evaluation. One of the things we're going to do is tie up loose ends. You have no idea what we're talking about right now. But let me give you a few examples of loose ends. If you're valuing a business, you take the free cash flow to the firm, which is cash flows from operations. You discount them at the cost of capital. You come up with the value of the operating assets of the company. And every valuation book after that says add cash. Whatever cash is on the balance sheet, don't, you can talk about excess cash, non-excess cash, but the cash is viewed as, hey, it's there, might as well count it, add it on. Now, I want to start off the pre-class test today with a question. And I've heard this more often than I want to, which is an analyst looking at a company says, look, this company has a big cash balance. And there are lots of companies with big cash balances, right? Not just the apples of the world, but 10, 20, 30 billion dollars in cash. The market will punish this company for holding cash because cash earns a return lower than the cost of capital. Now, what part of that statement is absolutely true? Cash earns a return lower than the cost of capital, of course. Now, let's ask a question of is that a bad investment? We've answered it, guys. Okay, but still, while you're holding it, aren't you then bearing that? But if you're $200 billion, that'll be a big discount in Apple's cash, right? Think of how long they'll have to wait to be able to use $200 billion. I mean, if that, that reasoning is true, we're getting, we, you should get massive discounts on Google's cash and Apple's cash because the cash balance is so big. Okay, carry that to the next step. What's the, when we say an investment is a bad investment, in capital budgeting, what are we saying about its net present value? Negative net present value. For a project to earn a negative net present value, it has to earn a return less than the return you'd require for that project, given what? Given its riskiness. That's it. That's all you need to do. You're done. Because what is cash? Cash is a riskless asset. What rate of return would you make? Would you or I make on a riskless in investment today? Go take a look at your savings if you have any. I'm sorry, that's what MBAs do to your savings. They ravage them. But whatever's left of your savings, take a look at it before the school takes the rest away. It's only a matter of time. Right? Take a look at how much, I mean, everybody has some cash in a money market account where you've swept the cash in, right? Take a look at what rate of return. You'll weep after you look at it. I mean, I looked at it yesterday just for the, uh, get, to get ready for the class. Last year, my cash swept into a cash account earned 0.05%. I should thank God I'm not in Sweden, right? Or Norway, wherever it is, where I have to pay the bank. But that 0.05% doesn't surprise me. Why? Because what was the T-bill rate last year? 0.05%. In fact, if my money market fund claims to be making 5%, I'm getting my money out of there as soon as I can. Because they're not investing in T-bills, they're investing in something very, very risky. And I don't want to mess with that. This is cash. So it's true cash earns a return lower than what you'd make on the cost of capital. But that's neither here nor there. That's always going to be the case. Today we're going to talk about why you might punish a company for holding cash. And it's not because cash earns a low rate of return. It's actually not cash you're worried about. It's what the company will do with the cash that should scare you. And we'll come back and put some flesh on that. Today we're also going to talk about what I think is the most troublesome issue in valuation, which is cross-holdings. You know what cross-holdings are? These are 5% of another company, 10% of another company, 55% of another company. 
that you happen to own. I didn't know this, but Altria owns 27% of SAB Miller. Did you know that? Surprise. So when you're valuing Altria, where is the 27% going to show up? God only knows. It's going to be somewhere hidden in the balance sheet at a number that you won't even recognize because it will reflect what Altria or Philip Morris when it invested in Miller invested in that. So we're going to do some very simple cross-holding valuation before we actually get to it. Let's see if you, have, you already have this stuff nailed down. Let's say company A owns 60% of company B and there's a significance to that 60% because now the financial statements are consolidated. I'm going to leave you to think about what consolidation means because you should have dealt with it in, the, in your accounting class. Let's say you use the financial statements of company A to value company A. These are consolidated statements. What percentage of company B have you... So when you come up with that free cash flow of the firm discounted the cost of capital, you use the consolidated company A statements to come up with the cash flows, right? You've discounted those cash flows of the cost of capital. Have you va how much of company B is in your value already? And I'll give you the choices. None of company B, 60% of company B, 100% of company B, 40% of company B. I've kind of covered the spectrum. Let's start with the 0%. How many think company B hasn't been valued yet? Okay, so everybody, or oh, you're not even sure. So none. If, none of, if you're not sure about any of the four, I'm going to come back and ask you all four again. How many think 60% of company B is in your value? That would make sense, right? You own 60%, but what's consolidation going to do? What does consolidation mean? That when you look at the EBIT, or the operating income for this company, what are you getting? You're getting 100% of company A plus 100% of company B. I'm going to talk about the absurdity of this process. I've never understood why accountants make you do this. It strikes me as absurd. But that's what you are essentially going to be doing. You're going to be valuing the combined operating income, the combined capex, the combined depreciation. So the right answer is you've actually valued 100% of company B. And do you see why that's going to be a problem? How much of company B do you actually own? 60, which means that you valued 40% that doesn't belong to you, which means now you've got to come up and mop up that loose end, which effectively means you've got to subtract out the 40% that doesn't belong to you. We'll talk about how people do it and why the way they do it is going to give them all, almost always the wrong answer. Now let's say you own 10% of company B. Now you've got a minority holding, right? I do exactly the same thing. I take your operating income, I come up with free cash flow to the firm, I discounted the cost of capital, I come up with the value. How much of company B is in that value? Let me give you the choices again. None of company B, 10% of company B, 100% of company B. None. None of company B, and here's why. Because if you have a minority holding, it is not going to be shown as part of your income. It will show up below the operating income line. Now here again, let's use the SAB Miller, which is actually going to be tomorrow's valuation of the week. They actually have a joint venture. You know what their joint venture is? So this is actually going to be a problem for them after the acquisition. They have a 50-50 joint venture, of course, with Molson Coors. That joint venture is treated as a minor, it's actually not consolidated. So actually you will see it below the operating income line. So if you value SAB Miller as a company, you haven't valued any of that joint venture. And this is not a minor issue. This is a $25 billion joint venture that you haven't really valued yet. More mopping up to do. Now you can see why I think of cross holdings as a mess because you have majority holdings, minority holdings, numbers all over the place, and you have to bring them all into the process. So let's say you've taken the cash flows, you've discounted them at the cost of capital, you've done the right thing with cash, whatever that right thing is, you value the cross holdings. And you're almost done when you start looking around. Dangerous thing to do, to see if there's something you haven't valued yet. So I'm going to list off some assets that you see on the balance sheet. And you have to decide whether you're going to add the value of these assets to your discounted cash flow valuation. What's the test you have to run when you think about each asset then? Have I valued it already? If you valued it already, then you should obviously ignore it. If you haven't valued it, you should add it on. This, this company owns 
a very valuable piece of real estate in New York. And I say valuable, it could be a half a billion, a billion dollars. Can I add the value of that headquarters building to my DC evaluation? Yeah. Lots of money center banks have real estate in New York. This could add. Why not? I'm sorry? Sure you can. You can't sell your headquarters building and do what? And keep it as your headquarters. That would be a coup if you could pull it off, right? You sell and say, hey guys, can I just leave all my guys in there? Now do you see why this is going to be double counting? Because when you value the company, you valued it as an operating company. To operate the company, unless you have a very cynical view of all those people sitting in the headquarters building, presumably they play a role in generating that operating income. You valued that real estate already when you did the valuation. But you think, what if the val value of the real estate is much, much, much higher than what the value of my company is? And I'll talk about a couple of examples, especially in Asia where this is starting to happen. Indian real estate companies that happen to have their factories in the middle of Mumbai, where the real estate is worth four times what the company is worth. We'll come back and address what to do then. But you can't add the two. That's one thing you cannot do because that's double counting. You can't have your cake and eat it too. How about vacant land? That's not been counted yet, right? So unless you've somehow incorporated that vacant land into stores you're going to build in the future, that's going to be the test. Have you br brought that in? If you haven't, that is an asset that's sitting there. You're saying, maybe I should add that on. What about patents if you're a pharmaceutical company? What's the test again? Have I counted it already? With a pharmaceutical company, how do you count the fact that you have valuable patents? You put that growth into your revenues, right? From what? New drugs you're going to create, which come from what? Those patents. You should not be adding the value of patents on to the value of a pharmaceutical company because that, do you see what the test you're running? Am I double counting? If the answer is yes, don't count it. Brand name. Increasingly, in, in, if you look at European companies, IFRS is allowing accountants to come up with these brand name numbers. The most dangerous thing I've ever seen happen. Same, Same problem. If I take Coca-Cola, I do a discounted cash flow evaluation, giving it high margins. Why do they have high margins? Not because the syrup tastes so good. Not because Coca-Cola is a magical cola. It's because they have that brand name. If I add the brand name on top, that's definitely double counting. What about Goodwill? SAP has $18 billion in Goodwill. What does that tell you? This company is overpaid for a lot of companies in the past. That's all it's uh, telling you, right? Nothing else, nothing more. There's nothing behind Goodwill. Try selling Goodwill on the street. A lot of Goodwill, you know, tell you, what, you want some Goodwill? It's the most useless of all assets. It's a catastrophic accounting item because it creates all kinds of bad practices. What if your CEO has been collecting Picassos for the last 20 years? Why not? This is now your Picasso, right? As a stockholder, don't do anything crazy and say, can I borrow that Picasso for a few weeks? But if you've got a CEO who's been entrenched for 20, I have to be in L'Oreal tomorrow. Who's the large stockholder in L'Oreal? Nestle and who else? The Betancourt family. Right? It's basically closely held by those two. Nestle, of course, is just another company. The Betancourt family is French royalty. I have to be careful about what I say about them tomorrow. Okay? But who knows what French royalty accumulates? Maybe there are champagne bottles in the basement which go back 200 years. I don't know whether champagne is good for 200 years, so forgive me if I'm messing up your champagne. But maybe there are, I'm sure there's stuff they own, like chateaus, skis, ski lodges, that technically belong to the company because the line between the Betancourt family's holdings and the company's holdings is probably a very gray one by now. Okay? If you can find all those assets, you should be adding them on. And in fact, there are lots of, new, uh, lots of US corporations which have apartments on Fifth Avenue. 
that are used probably 20 days a year. No? You could technically argue that all of those things belong to the company and need to be brought into the valuation. But the test you're running is, have I valued it already? If the answer is yes, don't value it again. Last issue. As you sit down to value a company and you talk to the other five or six people in your group who are also valuing companies, some of you are going to get really pissed off. And here's why. You'll talk to the person next to you and say, I finished my valuation in 10 minutes. I had this nice stable growth dividend paying bank. I put the dividend in the numerator, divide by cost of equity minus the growth rate, I'm done. What are you doing? So I'm valuing box. Much more difficult, right? Young growth company. I'm valuing GE. Companies kind of changing under you as you look at them. In other words, some companies are easier to value than others. Some are much, much easier, some are much more complex. And some of the complexity at companies comes from choices they've made as a company about how many countries to be in, how many businesses to be in. So some companies are naturally more complex than other companies. So let's say you're comparing two companies. Company A is in a single business, simple company. Financials are right there. You look at them and they tell you everything you need to know. Company B, you look at the company, you read the financials, you're not sure what language it's in. It claims to be in English, but you read it, it doesn't make any sense. You read it again, you get even more confused. You sit down to value both companies. And you use the same techniques. After all, it's cash flows and cost of capital. For one of you, it was easy to get the numbers. Everything was transparent. For, uh, for the other, it's like pulling teeth. But ultimately, you end up with a valuation. Let's say they have exactly the same numbers, same operating income, same reinvestment. So the numbers look the same on both companies. So when you do the discounting, the values that you arrive at are going to look the same, right? Now I want you to think like an investor. The values look the same, but as an investor, would you value the simple company more highly or the complex company more highly? I would value the simple company too. I'd make a confession. You open up my book, you read all, what, thousand pages of it? There isn't a single place where I tell you how to bring complexity into the valuation. Today we're going to talk about what to do when you get really pissed off at a company. Wouldn't it be nice at the end of the valuation if you could take out your frustrations and say, you really made my life difficult for the last three weeks. I'm going to take off 15% of your value. If nothing else, it'll be cathartic. Say, oh my God, I feel much better now. And I'm going to give you an avenue to doing that. So that's, those are all the things we're going to talk about today. Lots of fun stuff. So let's shut this off and go back to... our slides. So one of the first choices you're going to have to face when you sit down, assuming you haven't sit down, uh, sat down to do your DC evaluation is, you have to make some choices about what approach you're going to use to value a company. Remember there are two, so let's talk about forks in the road. The first fork you're going to come to in the road is, if you think about all the inputs you have, you have the cash flows, you have the discount rate, you have the growth rate, so you have all the techniques in front of you. But here's the first choice you're going to come up to. Am I going to value the equity in the business or value the entire business? Remember that choice? Take cash flows to equity, discount to the cost of equity. So let's look at that, that choice and see which one is better for you. Before you go down either of those roads, remember if you do it right, the value for your equity should be the same. And this was weekly challenge one, should be the same whether you value the equity directly or value the firm and subtract out debt. Right? So, if you ask me which is going to give me the right answer, the, my response is going to be they're both going to give you the same answer if you do them right. So this is a purely pragmatic decision where you're saying, on which choice am I less likely to screw up? I know it's a very minimal standard. So here's how you should think about it. Cash flows the firm are pre-debt cash flows, right? You take after-tax operating income minus net capex minus change in working capital cash flow to the firm. To get to cash flow at equity, What's, what are the additional layers I need? I need to bring in interest expenses, so that so start with net income. And I also need to bring in what's the additional item that shows up with free cash flow equity? New debt raised minus debt repaid, right? If you have a stable debt ratio, then you get that shortcut where you can use for the free cash flow equity, you multiply by one minus the debt ratio. But if your debt is changing, Estimating free cash flows to equity is going to be a really problematic exercise. 
People do it in LBOs, right? Because you've got to pay off old debt, then you take on new debt. But if you can avoid it, you want to avoid it. So here's my first suggestion to you. If you look at your company and you say, look, I expect my company's debt ratio to change over time. Or you look at your company and say, I have no idea what's going to happen to its debt ratio over time. Either are possibilities, then my suggestion is you go down the firm valuation route because you don't have to deal with the new debt issues and the net debt repayments. You just do pre-debt cash flows. You still bring in the debt ratio where? The firm valuation. It's not in the cost of, it's not, give away the answer. It's not in the cash flows, it's going to be in the cost of capital through the debt ratio. So you still have to tell me what the debt ratio will be over time, but you do it through a debt ratio and the cost of capital. So if your leverage is going to be changing, you're better off using a firm valuation. I'll make a prediction for 85% of you, when you get to this fork on the road, you're either going to think your debt ratio is going to change. Why? Because your company has no debt right now and you think it'll borrow more money. Or it's too much debt, it'll borrow, it'll pay off some debt. So if you're doing Glencore, let's face it, your debt ratio has to come down. Or third, you're just not sure. You're going to go down the firm valuation route. If not, you go down the equity valuation. So 85% of you are going to go down the firm valuation route, bring the debt ratio through your cost of capital, look at pre-debt cash flows. Let's look at the 15% who decide to go down the equity route. If you decide to go down the equity route, you have two ways of estimating cash flows to equity, right? One is what I call the lazy way, I'm sorry, which is to look at the dividends that the company pays out, and the other is to compute potential dividends, free cash flow equity. Which one should you use? If you can estimate free cash flow equity, please use free cash flow equity. Okay. If you cannot estimate free cash flow equity, it's desperation time. You have to take what you can get, in which case, you're stuck using the dividend discount model. You say, how would I not be able to estimate free cash flow equity? What do I need for free cash flow equity? I need to start with net income. Then I need net capex. I need change in working capital and change in debt, right? If you're working with a bank, an insurance company, an investment bank, you're very quickly going to realize getting those items is going to be close to impossible. It's like nailing jello to a wall, which means you're going to be stuck using the dividend discount model if you're valuing financial service companies or REITs and MLPs. REITs and MLPs because they're more bonds than stocks. The reason you buy them is for those hefty dividends. So but if you're in that subset of the market, you're going to stay with the dividend discount model. Everywhere else, if you've chosen the equity route, please try to estimate the free cash rate equity because it gives you more leeway. It allows you to have negative free cash flows equity if need be. Which discount rate should you use? By this time, you've already made the choice, right? Because once you've decided to go down the equity route, your discount rate has to be the cost of equity. If you've decided to value the entire firm, your discount rate has to be the cost of capital. Which currency? Again, the choice has already been made. If you decided to estimate your cash flows in pesos, your discount rate has to be in pesos. If you decide to do everything in real terms, then your discount rate has to be real. It's that problem one on that quiz, playing out again and again and again like Groundhog Day. Make sure you match up your discount rate to your cash flows. So you got your model chosen. You decide to value either equity or the firm. You picked your cash flows. You've come up with your discount rate. Now comes that choice about what kind of growth should I give this company. You don't have to give a company growth. It's entirely possible that your company is a mature company, in which case, don't mess with things. Just do the valuation as a stable growth company. So we're valuing Toyota. What's the high growth? It's already the largest market share company in the world. Okay. Question. Yeah. Well, if, if you're working with a high inflation currency, you're very quickly going to notice two problems. One is that the numbers start to get almost unmanageable as you go through time. Right, because you're putting in a 12% inflation rate, you're going to have this huge growth rate. Everything is going to become much more sensitive to your input. So if your inflation number is 12%, then your risk-free rate will be 14%. Your cost of equity will be 21, 25. So it's not that you can't do it right, but it's very inflation sensitive to your assumption. So you can either switch to real or switch to a different, different currency, right? Which is part of the reason, if you're doing your valuation in Zimbabwe, you're probably better off valuing the company in South Africa and RAND rather than in Zimbabwe and whatever, where inflation may be 3,000% or 5,000 or 7,000%. You're kind of stuck with those numbers. Okay. 
Now, in terms of growth, your company is already a mature company. It's growing at 1%, 2%. It's a big chunk of the market. It's treated as a mature company. Okay? We'll talk about the, the tests you've got to run, but make sure it has the characteristics of a mature company. If your company is a pretty large company, or a very large company with some growth potential left. Why? Because it's going into new markets, coming up with a new product. You might give it growth, but don't get carried away. Okay? Don't give it 15 years of growth. Maybe give it five years of growth and then bring it down very quickly to stable growth. That's a two-stage model. If your company is any other company, so if you're valuing the youngest, most exciting high growth company, a Shake Shack or a Box or a Twitter or a Facebook, Use a three-stage model, which means you'll have an initial period of high growth, then you've got to start to scale things down. That's basically what I've built into the FCFF models, is when you give me a growth rate, I give you five years of that growth rate, and then I start to bring the growth rate down towards your stable growth. If you don't like the five and five, just go in and tweak the spreadsheet. You can make it a you know, six and four or seven and three, not that it's going to make a huge difference, but you need some kind of a transition phase. So pick a cash flow, pick a discount rate, pick a growth period. This is like playing Lego. It's been a long time since you've played Lego, right? But you know, remember, Lego pieces don't all go into each other. The, you know, the, the, so you basically, you've got to think about the three boxes of Lego. You've got the cash flow box, you've got the discount rate box, you've got the growth period box. You put them together, you get a discounted cash flow model. Then you take them apart, you put three other pieces together. What I'm trying to say is people constantly came, claim to invent new discounted cash flow models. It drives me crazy. I know at least a couple of major name banks that have patented their discounted cash flow model. There's nothing to patent here. That's like saying, claiming you invented growth rates. Okay? But they have a three-stage model, all patented and filed away with multiple protections. There's nothing to protect. It's basically very basic. Cash flow, discount rate, growth period. Just be internally consistent. Your cash flows are equity cash flows. Don't try to squeeze that cost of capital piece onto that equity cash flow because that's when we get into trouble. Okay? So think about your company. What's right for your company will not be necessarily what's right for the next person in your group. You might be the lucky one with a stable growth, free cash flow to the firm model. You're lucky, don't look that luck in the face. Just finish your evaluation and move on. It'll be quick to do, but don't make yourself create growth periods when there are none to create. Okay? Any questions about choosing a model? So now let's talk about tying up the loose ends. A lot of the mischief in valuation happens after you tell me <coughs> you're done. You got those cash flows done, the cost of capital. You can do some real damage right after. Do you know, do you know how, how a sabbatical works in academia? Do you guys know it? I work incredibly hard. Like, I have to teach like four and a half hours a week. It's just overwhelming. They give me only like five months off each year. And because I work so incredibly hard, every seventh year I get the entire year off with pay. I'm sure you have something similar in your jobs that you've lined up. Okay? So. And people have these great plans. So every, it's very biblical, like six years of four and a half hours a week work and the seventh year off because you're so tired. So people usually have big plans for the sabbatical. They're going to write books. They're going to travel here. So about 10 years ago, which actually reminds me, I'm due two, two, two sabbaticals because I forgot to take one three years ago. Don't ask me how that happened. Okay. So about 10 years ago, I get a sabbatical. And I had a singular objective for my sabbatical. I want to do absolutely nothing for a whole year. I wanted to wake up every day for 365 days with a to-do list with nothing to do. And I'll make a confession. I was a little too ostentatious about this. I remember I went to Staples and I bought a to-do list. I stayed home. I put the to-do list above my little cubicle where I kind of have my little private space at home. And as my kids came down for breakfast before they went off to school, I pointed to my to-do list and said, kids, I have nothing to do today. Pissed them off no end. And, and then I made my fatal error. My wife came down the stairs and I said, hon, I have nothing to do today. She said, really? Why don't you start by walking the dog? So I walked the dog and come back, there's stuff on my to-do list. I said, what the heck is this? She says, pick up bok choy at the grocery store. I didn't even know what bok choy looked like. 
I was too embarrassed to ask. I didn't know whether it was a seafood, a meat, a vegetable. Finally, I found it was like ugly looking cabbage. <laughs> Took me two hours to find it. I come back, there's another to do, pick up kids from school. So after about the fifth or sixth to do on my list, I said, I've got to find things to do to keep my wife away from my list. <laughs> I get desperate. I said, give me something to do. And like, an act of providence, I get an email from the editor of CFA magazine, a magazine I've never read, and even though the magazine existed. He said, could you write a one-page article for us? My first reaction was, I'm on sabbatical, I'm not doing that. Then I remembered I needed things to do. I said, oh, sure, I'll write an article for you. And actually what I wrote for, it took about a day and a half, so I wrote in big letters on my to-do list, write one-page article for CFA magazine, cannot pick up bok choy, kids, etc., etc., etc. <laughs> kept my wife away from my to-do list for about a day. And it took me a day to write, and I have to make a confession, the only thing I've ever written in my life that's got me hate mail. You know how difficult it is to get hate mail in valuation? <laughs> People don't feel strongly enough, they say, I hate you for using implied equity risk premiums, I hate you for using bottom-up betas, but this actually got me hate mail for a couple of reasons. One was the title, it said, Stop the Garnishing. And what I was talking about is the practice in valuation where you finish the valuation and then you start going crazy. By doing what? Adding 20% for control, knocking 15% off for liquidity, adding 30% for this. I said, you gotta stop this because if you do this, you're gonna end up at the number you wanted to see in the first place after you've done all your premiuming and discounting. So I, th I don't think people like the word garnishing. I might have used the word arbitrary for the premiums and discounts and that might have pissed a few people off. But I really pissed them off, I think, with my ending paragraph where I said, what you're doing, and this is the analogy I drew, maybe this is a bad analogy, I said, what you're doing is the equivalent of my taking my second son, his name is Brendan, to an expensive Italian restaurant and ordering the most exotic pasta dish on the menu. Now, to give you some background on Brendan, he's now 23, and our kids, you know, on their birthdays, were allowed to pick their favorite restaurant to go to, and we'd all drive there within a 25 mile radius, Thai, Indian, Italian. And for much of his life, Brendan, when he was asked to pick his favorite restaurant, would pick Burger King. His vision of a dream dinner was a supersized chicken nuggets with fries and that milkshake, which really had neither milk nor shake in it, but some seaweed concoction. Okay? What I'm saying is Brendan and flavor don't go together. So if you went to an expensive Italian restaurant and ordered the most exotic pasta dish on the menu, the one that comes with the white sauce and green stuff, and he would not even touch his dad. There's all kinds of stuff on my noodles. The only way to eat it is if I took it to the sink, washed off every ounce of flavor, and you eat the plain noodles with a lot of butter. In which case, what have I done? Paid $35 for a bowl of wet noodles, right? I could have done this at home. I say, that's what you're doing in valuation. You create these exotic valuations with cash flows and discount rates, and then you wash out every ounce of flavor by adding 30% for some arbitrary control, knocking off 25% for illiquidity. So a wave of hate mail comes, and I actually create a smart mailbox on my Mac where I look for words like, you know, all the bad words. And say, but they'd send there, put it in there, and I just dumped the whole folder without even looking at it. But one email came through and it made a point, a, a decent point. It said, look, if you don't like the way we're dealing with control and synergy and all this stuff, why don't you come up with a better way of doing it? And I said, that's fair enough. And I have 11 months left on my sabbatical. Here's what I'm going to do. Each month I'm going to pick up a loose end, something that people are premiuming and, or discounting, and talk about how I would value that loose end from scratch. The first week I start with cash, then I move to control, then I move to synergy, then cross holdings. And in fact, it's half of one of my books. Now, is the second half of the book of the modern evaluation is basically those loose ends. It's 11 months of my sabbatical in 11 chapters. So what I'm gonna do is take you through a speedy tour of those loose ends, starting with cash and starting with the question of what should we do with cash? Should, when should you discount cash? Okay. Then I'm going to talk about cross holdings. As I said, very tough to deal with, especially with the Asian and Latin American companies where this is almost an art form, the way these companies are created. Then I want to talk about what else should I be adding on? What's not been counted yet? Then once I get to the value of the firm, I'm going to talk about should we punish companies that are complicated companies okay, for being complicated. 
then once you get to, we're going to come back and talk about debt. We've already talked about debt in the context of coming up with debt and the cost of capital. Now we get a chance to revisit that debt. And here we're going to ask the question, what happens if you have underfunded pension obligations or health care obligations? What if you're violating Volkswagen? You come up with a discarded cash flow valuation. You know there are lawsuits coming. You know there are fines coming. And that go beyond the provisions you see on the financial statements. What do you do with those? Should you be subtracting those out? And how, if you decide to subtract them out, do you come up with that number? Then I want to talk about control. What exactly is this control thing that people keep throwing around? What are you controlling? Why does it have value? And how do you value it? What if your company is distressed? What if you're valuing Glencore? And the thing you're worried about is that your company will not make it. Today, I'm going to put up my valuation of Lyft. And the biggest, actually from an investor standpoint, Lyft looks like a better bargain at two and a half billion than Uber does at 51. But you know what the biggest threat to Lyft is? That Uber will drive it out of business because it's burning through cash like crazy. And unless it keeps accessing capital, the game is over for Lyft. So when I value Lyft, I've got to factor in, what if they run out of capital and nobody's willing to provide them with more capital? That's survival risk. Then I want to talk about equity options. Not as prominent as they used to be a decade ago because companies have shifted away from equity options. We'll talk about why. But how do you factor in these other equity claims that essentially drain from your value? Then once you come up value for the final value, what do we do about illiquidity? One of the issues that's going to come up in the Ferrari IPO is only 10% of the shares are going to be offered to the public. You're saying, so what? That's called float. Those are the number of shares that are out there that can be traded. It can cut in both ways. Because you have low float, your stock price can get pushed up. Because you have low float, you also can, can get a liquidity, which can cause your stock price to get pushed down. So liquidity can cut in both ways. We have to talk about what do we do about illiquid companies. And especially, we'll expand this later on when we talk about valuing private businesses, because there you're really worried about illiquidity as a major factor. So you ready? Let's get started. Let's start with cash. If you open up any valuation book, what you're supposed to do with cash is very simple. Just count the cash, add it on. Once in a while, you get this line between excess cash and operating cash. And I would suggest, as when we talked about working capital, that you draw the line differently between wasting cash and non-wasting cash. If you truly have cash that has to sit in the form of currency, take it out. But for most companies, most of the cash is going to be excess cash. You should be adding it on. In practice, cash is an incredibly mangled asset, especially in equity valuations. And here's why. What do we start with in equity valuations to get to cash flow equity? We start with net income, right? And that's why, in fact, I drew the distinction between non-cash net income and cash net income, because cash gets mangled in typical equity valuations if it goes into cash flow equity and then gets discounted back at the cost of equity. So I'm going to give you a very simple exercise to see if, in fact, it's this simple, that cash should be valued at what you see on the balance sheet. I'm going to show you three companies. And they're going to look exactly the same in terms of enterprise value and cash. So basically, assume I've done a valuation of the operating assets. I come up with a billion. Each has a $100 million in cash. And here's where the three companies are going to be different. Company A has a return on capital of 10% and a cost of capital of 10%. It's a developed market company. Company B has a return on capital of 5% and a cost of capital of 10% is a developed market company. Company C has a return on capital of 22% and a cost of capital of 12% and is an emerging market company. Say, so what does it matter whether it's developed or emerging? Put that into the equation, see if it makes a difference. I'm going to argue that in one of these three companies, cash is going to be a neutral asset. What does that mean? 100 million is going to be valued at 100 million. In one of these three companies, cash will get discounted. And one of these three companies, cash might actually trade at a premium. Let's start with the easy one first. In which of these three companies is cash most likely to be a neutral asset? And what is it about A that makes it a neutral asset? It's what I call a blah company. What do blah companies do? They don't do any harm. They don't do any good. They just run in place. And before you beat up on blah companies, there are fates far worse than investing in a blah company. In which of these three companies are going to discount cash in the hand of the company. What is it about B that scares you? It's history, right? What's the history of B? That it has a history of taking bad projects. I call this the stupidity discount. 
these guys are so stupid that they will find a way to mangle your cash. You think that's absurd? What kind of company would that be? I could name a hundred companies for you. I'll give you this one. Would you want Hewlett Packard to have any of your cash? If I'm a stock, I'm actually a stockholder. I would have a proposal at the meeting. At the end of every day, I'd like to come in and clean out all your checking accounts and leave you with no cash every day because I've seen what you guys do with cash, which is screw it up big time. This is a company that in the last five years has done two acquisitions that they've written off, and in each one they've written off eight and a half. One time I can understand you made a mistake. Two times you write off eight and a half billion dollars. These are really big mistakes on top of each other. So in company B, you're going to get a discount on cash, not because cash earns a low rate of return. That's not your problem, but because they might decide to do something stupid with the cash. Company C, you might actually attach a premium. Let's see why. In traditional corporate finance, no company needs a cash balance. Because here's what we assume, you have a great project, what do I assume you can do? You go out, raise capital, what's the big deal? Billion dollars, go raise the billion dollars, capital markets are always open, always accessible, you raise money at a fair rate of return, you take the project. Now do you see why I put the, project, the company in Argentina? You're an Argentine company with a great project. You decide to go to the capital markets. At least five times in the last 15 years, you go to the equity market, equity market shut down. There are big chains outside saying, shut down for the foreseeable future. You go to the bank, the bank's refusing to lend money. There's no bond market. When capital markets are constrained, do you see why having cash can potentially be a strategic weapon? Not only does it let you take great projects as they come along, but if you get into a crisis, what else can you do? You can go to other companies that need cash desperately and buy their assets at a discount. Cash might actually trade a premium. My only mistake in this example was I put this company in Argentina. I was in Brazil a year ago. I put the ex exact example up. There were 150 people in the room, to a person. Every person in the room said, company C is where we discount the cash. So why? So those Argentines, you can't trust them. This was after a really bad soccer loss too, so they were bringing out other kinds of issues coming out. But the reality is in emerging markets, you can see why companies might hold cash and why it's not a bad thing. And it's not just emerging markets, right? Because if you look at small tech companies, you see why it might make sense for these companies to hold cash? When I see equity research analysts jump on small tech companies and say, how come you have two billion in cash? They're missing the point that these companies need the cash to survive. They don't have access to open capital markets if you're a small tech company and the market drops 20%. So cash is not that simple. You see, it's, it's not. So, but the reason we're discarding cash again is not because cash earns a low, low rate of return. Cash by itself has never ever hurt an investor. It's because you don't trust the managers of this company, whatever this company is, with your cash. That's why you can have a company the size of Google with an $80 billion cash balance and nobody whispers a word about the cash. At the same time, you can have an HP with a $5 billion cash balance and people are jumping on HP saying, give me the cash back. Yes, sir. That's a good question. How much would you discount the cash? It depends on how stupid you think the managers are, right? I, they, it's basically, I mean, I'm not being, in fact, if you can tell me typically what kind of return on capital you make on the cash, roughly speaking, the discount is going to be proportional to the return on capital divided by the cost of capital. For company B, for instance, it's going to be about a 50% discount. That's a scary looking discount, but that's exactly what will happen if all the cash gets invested at a 5% return, you need to make a 10% return. So it becomes as simple as looking at your past track record and saying, you guys have a history of taking bad projects. I'm going to bring that into the cash balance. You're saying, is this possible? Do markets actually do it? There's actually some evidence that markets are a lot more discriminating on cash than we think they are. This is actually from a study that looked at just US companies and asked the question, how much is a dollar in cash valued at, at in the hands of these companies? It's actually a very creative study. They took a, you know, thousands of US companies. They took their cash balances. They try to figure out what, what value investors were attaching to cash. So remember again, what, every, what does every textbook say? A dollar in cash should be valued at a dollar. 
I'll give you the good news first. Across all U.S. companies, a dollar in cash is valued at a dollar. So we're, we're okay, right? But here's where it starts to get interesting. When they focused on mature firms with negative excess returns, what does that mean, negative excess returns? Your return in capital is less than your cost of capital, like company B. Cash was trading at 69 cents on the dollar. Think about that. You have a $10 billion cash balance. You have a bad history. The cash is being priced as if it's $6.9 billion. If you are giving value enhancement advice to this company, it's very simple, right? What are you going to tell them? What should they do? Just give the cash back. You know how much they'll fight you? No, we've changed. We've turned over new leaves. And that's when a Carl Icahn steps in. I mean, I've said this about Carl Icahn multiple times. And one of these days, I'm going to get into trouble for saying it, but I'll say it again. The guy's about this deep and this wide. His corporate finance components, basically, if you think about it, you look at every company he's targeted, here's what he says. You got too much cash, give me the cash. Take a look at it. You go back at his history. That's basically it. But you know what his strength is? He targets companies like this one because, think about it, 31% discount disappears overnight. That's all you need. You made your money, you move on. You don't have to take great projects. You don't have to break up the company. You don't have to do any other stuff. It's just returning the cash, you know, releases the discount. So in fact, if you want to go to Capital IQ, there's a very simple way in which you can become Carl Icahn. Except you need a few billion dollars, but that's your problem. <laughs> just do a screen for what? Do a screen for companies with not just single digit returns on capital, returns on capital that are less than 5%, that have cash balances that are more than 10%, 15%, 20% of value, and where managers don't own very many shares in the company. You can actually screen for all three. You'll get a list. Then maybe you're not Carl Icahn, but you can piggyback on the Carl Icahn to the world. So what are you going to do? You're going to buy some of those companies and hope that a Carl Icahn shows up. Yeah. So try it out. You know? So those are mature firms. When they focus on high growth firms that earn well above their cost of capital, a dollar in cash, was actually priced at $1.22. Even though that cash might be earning a really low rate of return, markets don't seem to be phased by those low rates of returns, at least in the hands of these companies. Now let's extend this discussion. What makes cash easy to value? It's right there, right? Unless you're a company like Satyam Computers, in which case right there is not right there. Satyam Computers was this Indian company that claimed to have a cash balance that could not be confirmed. And they kept telling auditors, because they were a global company, the cash was in circulation. I don't know where, up there somewhere. And the auditors bought into it until one day they said, when is it going to land? Never. <laughs> that, that's an odd accounting scandal where the cash balance was actually in question. But cash should be easy to value because it's there, you count it, you're done, right? You know what else should be easy to value? You buy 25% of a publicly traded company. Let's suppose you are a company whose assets are all stocks and other publicly traded companies. It's easy to value, right? Because if you have 15 companies, I know the market price of each. I take each of them, add them up. I come up with the value of your company. Now, these should be very easy companies to attach a price to. Now, whether you've heard of closed end mutual funds. A typical mutual fund, when you send money in, the number of units expands, and you get a share of whatever the net asset value of the fund is. In a closed-end fund, you actually buy shares in a public company which owns stocks and other publicly traded companies. So it should be that you should still get a share of whatever those shares are worth, right? But if you look at what closed-end funds trade at, they trade at about a 15 to 20 percent discount on their assets. And their assets are all market value. In fact, when, it, when, when they fir we first found this out in finance, we called this the closed end fund puzzle. You see why it's a puzzle? What seems to be the opening here if you're an investor? You're a company, you own $100 million of publicly traded stock, you're trading at $80 million. So what do you think should happen? People should buy in, buy the entire fund, liquidate it, and claim the $20 million difference, right? There are a couple of things that get in the way. One is the 
corporate governance of these funds is so difficult that buying the fund is difficult. And second, you've got to bring in tax costs because those, when you liquidate those shares, you might not get the 100 million. But it still remains a puzzle. But let's think about why you might actually discount a closed-in fund. Let's try a simple example. Let's assume that you invest in a mutual fund, and this is one of these closed-in funds. Let's assume that this fund is invested in stocks that are roughly average risk stocks, beta 1. And that you expect the market to make 11.5% a year going forward. So your expected return on the market is 11.5%. What's the history of active money managers? They don't deliver, they deliver something less than the 11. So let's assume this guy's just not a bad guy, he's just an average guy. So you expect him to deliver 11% sort of 11.5%. Why? Because he's got, got to cover his transactions costs, his analysts' expenses, etc. If you expect this fund to continue in perpetuity, in other words, you can't liquidate this fund, and you invest $100 in this fund, what's going to happen to the $100? It's going to make 11% a year, right? So think of that as $11 perpetuity. What's the present value of per perpetuity? You take the cash flow, which is 11, and to get the present value, you divide it by the required rate of return given its risk, which in this case is 11.5% because it's an average. You divide $11 by 11.5%, you get about $96.38. So what? There's your discount right there. It's about a 3.7% discount. Why? Because you expect this fund to earn a half a percent less than expected. If you expect this fund to make 1% less than expected, you're going to discount it even more. 1.5% more than expected, discount it even more. You expect this fund to earn 1.5% less than expected and grow every year, you're going to discount it even more. Just work out the math. To me, it's not a puzzle. If you have active money managers consistently doing less well than they should, given what their required rate of return is, you will discount the fund. What if you expect this fund to be run by a superior money manager, and he's going to deliver half a percent more than the required rate of return, then what should this fund trade at? It's traded at a premium, right? What's the most famous closed-end fund in the world? It's called Berkshire Hathaway. And I'll tell you why I think of it as a closed-end fund. Typically, how do insurance companies work? You collect premiums, then the insurance company hires money managers to manage the money, but they're all average money managers. So the money creation usually comes from the insurance company side. Right, that you collect the premiums, you pay out less in, in claims, you keep the difference. It's a money-making insurance company. Berkshire Hathaway's capital arm is Geico. Really good insurance company. But that money that they collect in premiums gets managed, has historically been managed by the best money manager of the last century, which of course was Warren Buffett. Now you see why I call it a closed end fund? If you look at Berkshire Hathaway's investments, the money is collected from the insurance company. It's, of course, invested in stocks that were picked by a great stock picker, which effectively means that not only has, have you made money on both sides of the balance sheet, not just from an insurance company, but also by You now have a premium being attached over the market value of the stocks you own. Why? Because you think that this can continue into the future. Berkshire Hathaway, if you compare it to the other insurance companies, has always traded a premium because, in a, in a sense, you've had the Warren Buffett premium. But there is an interesting thing that has been happening over the last few years. The premium has become smaller and smaller and smaller. It peaked around 2000. It's kind of compressed over time. Why? I'm sorry? Well, it's a, if I plotted Buffett's age on the same graph, that's all I need to do, right? I mean, let's face it. You could think he's the greatest money manager in the world, but he is still a mortal. I mean, some people might take issue with that, but no, I, I think he's still mortal, which means at 88, 87, whatever he is, his days are numbered. I don't mean to sound morbid. And the market is building that in. It doesn't matter how great the succession plan is. Let's face it. He was one of a kind, right? I don't care how much he says, I've picked the right guy. 
The reality is he succeeded not just because of who he was, but the time that he entered the market. There were a bunch of things that came together that I don't think that you're ever going to get that kind of synthesis. Maybe I'm just being pessimistic, which means the market essentially is going to start to make it look more like a typical insurance company. So if you're Berkshire Hathaway stockholders, that's what you worry about, right? Is because there is that transition phase. It might take a little while for it to start to show up at the prices, but there will be that adjustment. So think of closed-end funds essentially as an extension of the same issue that we had with cash, which is you think of how well people pick stocks, the way you build that in is through the premium. Incidentally, the, 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 this is one aspect of Warren Buffett's success that I think we need to think about. Most portfolio managers, even if you're a great stock picker, you have to worry about your client's time horizon, right? You see why? You pick a great stock, your clients get impatient, six months from now they want the money back. You see the advantage of investing insurance premiums? The actuarial tables don't panic for the most part. So in a sense, you know your time horizon, you have a much more, pre and that's actually a great asset to have in portfolio management, is to be able to have. The question is, wh why don't other insurance companies use the same benefits? The problem is you don't have the other half the equation of picking stocks. It's not going to be enough to be able to control the flow of capital. Now let's talk about cross holdings. The biggest problem you're going to face in dealing with cross holdings is learning the accounting for cross holdings. Because there are three ways you can account for cross holdings. The first is if you own two, three, four percent of a company and take absolutely no role in how that company is run. It's called a minority passive investment. And here's what you have to do with a minority passive investment. In your income statement, you have to show the dividends you receive from that investment. Dividends. Not net income, not operating income. And in the balance sheet, you have to show what you originally invested to get this minority passive investment. So I'll give you a classic example of how disconnected this can get. In 1997, a company called SoftBank, heard of them, the Japanese venture capital firm, that was one of the original VCs in Yahoo, derived 70% of their value from one holding, a 7% holding of Yahoo that was classified as a minority passive investment. 70%. It was a $7 billion value. If you looked at SoftBank's income statement, what you'd have seen were the dividends they received from this holding, which in 1997 was zero. You'd have seen nothing. You say, okay, let me go check out the balance sheet. If you went and checked out the balance sheet, you'd have seen a $50 million investment in Yahoo because that was the original VC investment. Completely disconnected from reality. That's minority passive. What's much more common is what's called minority active, which is you own 15, 20% of a company, you have to use what's called the equity approach. And what's the equity approach? You don't have to show the revenues in the operating income, but below the operating income, you have to show 20% of the net income or net loss of the company you have the holding. It's a little better than dividends, right? And in the balance sheet, you have to show an updated book value, at least, the retained earnings since. So it's book value gets updated from your original investment. So better than minority passive, but not by much. And then you get to 60% of a company and accountants flip out. That's when you're required to consolidate. So what do they do? When you get to revenues, they say, act like you own 100%. You say, but I don't own only 60%. They say, don't worry about it. You get operating income, act like you own 100%. I own only 60%. Don't worry about it. You get to the balance sheet, you act like I own 100% of the assets. Yeah, I own only 60%. They say, don't worry about it. In the last moment, they say, but you own only 60%. So say, that's what I've been trying to tell you all this time. You don't own 40%. Exactly. We have to show the 40% that doesn't belong to you on the balance sheet. And hence is born the most ill-named item on the balance sheet, perhaps after Goodwill. So what do you see on a balance sheet reflect the 40% that doesn't belong to you? Minority interests are non-controlling interests. So when you first value a company, that's the first thing to do is go into the balance sheet, check on the liability side. If you see minority interests and non-controlling interests, what that reflects is the fact that this company owns a majority stake in another company, has consolidated all the financials, and you have to take out that 40% if you value the company based on the consolidated. So let's see how messy this process is going to get. Let's assume I come to you with a company which has consolidated financials. I do my discounted cash flow valuation using cash flow to the firm and the cost of capital. I come up with a value of a billion. 
I then subtract out the debt again from the consolidated balance sheet of 200 million. <laughs> the value that I would get for the equity in com the company is a billion minus 200 is 800 million, right? So let's say we're there. Then I say, oh my God, company owns 10% of company B, and that is being classified as a passive holding. If the market cap of company B is 500 million, so I want somebody to keep a running tab. We were at 800 before I threw this information in. Now you own 10% of company B, its market cap is 500 million, and I ask you for an updated value. What are you going to do? Add, subtract, ignore. Add 10% of 500 million, and then keep your fingers crossed because you've just taken an intrinsic valuation, and to that you've added a 10% of the actual market price. So you're mixing up apples and oranges, but you're now too far gone to even worry. So you're now at 850, right? And then I give you a third piece of information. Company A owns 60% of company C, and everything's been fully consolidated. Then just as a kind of add-on, I say the minority interest in the company is 40 million. What do I do with that 40 million? Add, subtract, or ignore? Subtract. So I'm going to take 800 plus, you see what a mess I've created? The 800 was an intrinsic valuation, right? The 50 was 10% of a market value. The 40 is, it's a book value. So basically I've taken intrinsic value plus market cap minus book value, what do I get? Complete and total chaos. So if I wanted consistency, what do I need to do? If I wanted to make this a true intrinsic valuation, what do I need to do? I need to value company B, and I need to value company C. So let's assume I do an intrinsic valuation of company B at 250 million, and I do an intrinsic value of company C at 250 million. So give me the corrected value now. I start with 800. I gave you an intrinsic value of 250 million for company B. They own 10% of company B. So 800 plus 25 is 825. Now what's the last step? I need to subtract out 40% of 250 million, which is 100 million, 825 minus 100 is 725 million. If I want to value cross holdings, right, that's what I need to do is I need to value not just the parent company, but all of the subsidiaries with full intrinsic valuations. Is this even doable? To, yes, if, to, for it to be doable, I need financials for all of my companies. Okay. And if I can get the financials, here's what I suggest you do. Rather than do this consolidated minor, minus minority, value the parent company as a standalone, value each of the subsidiaries separately, then start adding up. Value the parent company plus 10% of company B plus 60% of company. You see the advantage of doing that? Is then you can give different cost of capital, different growth rates, very different estimates. So in the case of SAB Miller, instead of attaching the growth rate for South Africa to the growth rate for Coors earnings, which are going to be US-based, I can treat each company separately, give it a different cost of equity, different cost of capital, different growth rate, but it is a lot of work. When is it worth doing it? When the subsidiaries are really big. I'll give you an example. I had to value Yahoo a year and a half ago. Yahoo as a, par as a parent company is just a search engine without much revenues. You know, pretty, it's actually a declining business. Here's what I got as my intrinsic valuation of Yahoo. My intrinsic valuation of Yahoo based on what I projected as revenue growth for Yahoo US, which is their base business, was 7.36 billion. But I'm not quite done because Yahoo has two big cross holdings. One was 35% of Yahoo Japan, which is a separately traded company. And the advantage was this was a public company. So I was able to do a full valuation of Yahoo Japan. Came up with the value for this. So the value that I got for Yahoo Japan equity was 21 billion. I took 35% of that. So basically I valued Yahoo parent plus 21% of Yahoo Japan. I'm not quite, I'm sorry, 35% of Yahoo Japan. There's a third piece. At the time that I did this valuation, Yahoo also owned 22% of Alibaba. And the nice thing was, this was right after Alibaba had filed its, you know, its prospectus for its IPO, so I had its full financials. I wouldn't have been able to do this if I tried to do it two months earlier. But because I had the full financials, I valued Alibaba's operating assets at $128 billion, the value of its equity at $146 billion, and I gave them 22% of that. 
So the value of Yahoo as a company is 7.4 billion. This is Marissa Meyer's empire right there, plus another 7.3 billion Yahoo Japan, plus 32 billion in Alibaba. You add those numbers up, you, there was, it, to the extent that they were required to actually liquidate a portion of their Alibaba holdings as part of the IPO, I subtracted out the taxes due because their original investment in Alibaba was so small that when they liquidated, they'd have a big taxes due, which is what they're now fighting with the IRS over. Okay? I actually assumed they'd have to pay the full taxes. Okay? And what I got as a value per share was about 41. Its actual price was at about 38. So I said, you want to invest in Alibaba? There's a cheap way you can do it. You essentially buy Yahoo, you're getting a discount, Alibaba shares discounted no? on their intrinsic value. Forget about market price. But to do this, I was able to do this because I had full, full financials for Yahoo the parent, Yahoo Japan, and Alibaba. So that's the first way to approach cross holdings is to break it up. Now I'll tell you what's going to create the problem. This was because I had three businesses, I had full financials for each. For many companies with cross holdings, you're going to run into trouble because getting full financials for your cross holdings is not always easy. Okay. I'll tell you a story. About 15 years ago, I was actually I was valuing a Japanese company for one of my investment valuation editions. I don't know, second edition, third edition. So Valuing a Japanese company in the late 90s, was all, we were always teetering on the edge of disaster because the yen risk-free rate was so much lower than everybody else's risk-free rate that if we weren't careful, the valuation would blow up. So I was very careful. I finished the valuation. I'm patting myself vigorously on the back for a job well done. When I read the financials for the company, they say they have 226 cross holdings. My task is laid out for me, right? So what do I need to do? value 226 other companies to invest in this one damn company. There is no way I'm doing that. I'm too lazy to do it. But even if I decided to go down that route, here was the second problem I'd have faced. 66 of those companies were public companies, 160 were private businesses, and there was zero information, nothing on these companies. No revenues, no operating income, nothing. So I called the investment relations office of the Japanese company and said, look, I'm valuing a company, it's not for an expose. And I need some information on these cross holdings. She said, I cannot give you that information. It is proprietary. The way she said proprietary was kind of scary. I said, okay. What if I bought a thousand shares in your company and then called you? She said, it would still be proprietary. I said, really? I would be a part owner of your company and you're refusing to tell me what I own. Is that right? She thought about it for a moment. She said, you have a point, but it's still proprietary. <laughs> I said, why am I banging my head against a brick wall? I'd get ready to hang up the phone. She said, no, wait, wait, I do have something I can tell you about these cross holdings. I said, maybe she's going to give me some information about revenues or operating income. I said, what? She said, I cannot give you any specifics, but I have to tell you these cross holdings are worth a lot. <laughs> I said, how many zeros are there in a lot? And I think it cuts to the heart of the cross-holding culture because that's what companies do. They hold up a brown paper bag and say, trust me, it's full of cash. You kind of look in the back, no, no, no. It's full of cash. I mean, come on, you walk down a New York City street, somebody walks up to you with a brown paper and says, trust me, it's full of cash. My advice is turn and run in the opposite direction because it's not full of cash. I don't know what it's full of, but it's, whatever it is, you don't want it. But as long as we say, okay, tell me how much is in the bag, why would any company ever let you look in the bag? But that's the reality we face. So many of you are going to get to this stage, you're going to look at the cross holdings, hopefully they're not as big as Yahoo Japan and Alibaba, because then you're in trouble. But if they're small cross holdings, and you don't have the information to value them, there are two choices. One is to estimate a price for those cross holdings. You'll have a book value for the holdings, right? What I try to do is, if, if I know, for instance, you have a chemical sub and the book value is 100, I go into my, my industry averages and I look up the price to book ratio for chemical companies across the board. Let's say it's 1.25. I'll take your 100 million, multiply by 1.25 and say, the estimated market value for your chemical sub subsidiary is 1.25. You're saying, that's very sloppy. I agree. But without the information, what else are you going to do? 
So either use book value or an adjusted book value to get to your holdings. And the other is to try to, to try to do a full pricing across the board. So let me take Yahoo and show you how this would have worked out. Okay? So I took the market cap of Yahoo. Okay? And by the point that I did this, there was already numbers floating around for what the market pricing would be for Alibaba and Yahoo Japan. And Yahoo Japan was already publicly traded. So here's what I did. I started with the market cap of Yahoo, which was 33. So that was the actual price, 33.76. I subtracted out 35% of Yahoo Japan, because it's a publicly traded company. Just multiply the market cap by 35%. And then I subtracted out 22% of what people were estimating the IPO to be at, 150 billion. I came up with, with a number. Then I subtracted, then I added back the taxes due, the Yahoo debt, the cash. In other words, I was trying to back into what value the market was attaching for Yahoo's operating assets, given the price and given what else. So do you see what I'm doing? Essentially, I'm taking the market price and I'm subtracting out the market prices of everything that I got there. And here's what I got as a bottom line. Based on my numbers, the market was attaching a value of minus six billion to Yahoo's US operations. Marissa Meyer doesn't have to do much to beat that. In fact, she, doesn't, she can do nothing and she's gonna beat expectations. So if you have a company with a lot of cross holdings that are priced, this is the, other, the process by which you can back into whether you think the pricing of this company is right. You can do an intrinsic valuation then of Yahoo's operations and see if it beats that imputed value. So two paths with, with cross holdings. If you can do an intrinsic valuation, go down that path. If not, try to price it the best you can. Any questions on cross holdings? Let's talk about what else you might want to add on. Remember what are the rule. If you cannot double count something. So if you've already counted something in the cash flows, you can't also count that asset as part of your value. So you're looking for truly vacant assets. I'll tell you an example of something that analysts used to add, at least in the late 90s, the values of companies. You know how a pension plan works? You can have two, two ways you can structure a pension plan as a company. You can have a defined contribution plan or a defined benefit plan. In a defined contribution plan, people put money into a pension, it gets invested somewhere, and they're just paid out based on whatever it makes. So there's no risk to the company because the company hasn't promised any pensions other than whatever they put in and whatever it's invested at. On a defined benefit plan, they promise you a fixed pension payment. So you put money in, they invest that money in stocks or bonds or whatever they have to invest in. And every year, the actuary comes in and estimates the value of the benefits they have promised and what they have set aside to cover those benefits. And what you've set aside covers what you promised. You've got a correctly funded plan. If you have promised more than you can deliver, you have an underfunded plan. We'll come back and talk about it. But in the late 90s, because stocks had gone up so much, lots of companies had overfunded plans. And technically, that overfunding belongs to you as an equity investor, right? Because it's you, the one set it aside. So a lot of analysts in the late 90s would take that overfunding and add it on to their DCF valuation saying, you know what, that's your money, I'm gonna add it on. There are two catches with doing that. The first is if you actually try to take money out of that fund, there's a tax consequence which is catastrophic. It's like a 55% tax rate. Second, you can kiss labor relations goodbye if you ever do that. So companies tend not to pull over funding out. But it does give you a benefit, right? So if you're valuing a company that is an overfunded pension plan, rather than put it in as an added value, what's the other technique you could use to bring it into the valuation? What's the advantage of having an overfunded pension plan? You don't have to put in as many contributions. So basically what that means is your cash flows going forward will be higher. You'll give yourself a benefit, but it's a more realistic benefit because that's how you capture it. But I want to talk about other assets. What else should I be adding on? And vacant assets are really tough to find because almost everything is being partially used. So I'll give you an example of a truly unique asset. Anybody here on the price fund? The Michael Price Fund? Oh, okay. So as you know, the Michael Price Fund is a fund run by MBAs that essentially invests real money in real stocks and makes real returns, as opposed to what? You know, artificial money in artificial stocks and makes artificial returns. So it's been around a while. I've never had an official connection to the Michael Price Fund. Obviously, a lot of people have been in the fund, have gone through this class, and sometimes they come and try their pitch out on me because they've got to pitch it to the, to the other people in the fund. I remember about seven years ago, it's 
student comes into my office and he says, I'm facing a conundrum. I had to get on Google, you know, thesaurus and check up what he was, and he was confused, basically. I don't know why he didn't just say I was confused. But I liked this out of the words. I decided I was going to use it on him as many times as I could. So what's your conundrum? He said, I'm valuing Playboy. I said, I don't see a conundrum yet. So I've come up with a value of 240 million, the stock is trading at 280 million. I still don't see a conundrum. By now I was very fond of the word, I was going to use it more often than I could. Okay. Then he said, but there's one asset that Playboy owns that I haven't brought into the valuation. Know what he was talking about? What is it? Yeah. Hugh Hafner is no longer an asset. Let's <laughs> He's a doddering liability, but you're very close. Where does he live? The mansion. The mansion. The mansion. Playboy Mansion actually belongs to Playboy, the company. We have it driven by it in LA. It's one of the most valuable pieces of real estate now in LA. It's estimated to have a value of 80 to 100 million. Do you see what his conundrum was? 240 million was the value of Playboy as a company. It owns this piece of real estate that could be worth 100 million. If you add that on, Playboy looks cheap. The only promise. There is an 85-year-old in a bathrobe who's hanging out in that building, and you can't exactly evict him without huge PR issues. So I said, you're right, it does belong to the company, but you can't get your hands on it. So he said, what should I do? I said, check the actuarial tables. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? He said, what am I checking for? Check to see how long 85-year-olds in bathrobes who hang out around 26-year-old playmates tend to live. It's a huge stress on your heart any moment now. You can. So let's say it's five years. You see what to do next? Take the value of the real estate, discount it back five years, adjust for taxes paid, add to the 240 million, you're done. That's a truly vacant asset. I'll tell you the trickier things is these real estate. Last time I was in India, I was actually, this became a big issue because in India there are these old real estate companies in the heart of Mumbai, you know, prime real estate. You value this company as a, re I'm sorry, as a textile, co textile companies, essentially, in the middle of Mumbai. You value them as textile companies, you get a value of 300 million. The value of land they're sitting on could be a billion. So an analyst would put up his hand and say, well, what do I value the company at? Let's look at the choices here. You could value it at 300 million, which is the present value of the cash flows, discount the cost of capital as a textile company. You could value it at a billion, which would be the value of the real estate. You could add the billion to the 300 million, come up with 1.3 billion. One of these three should be off the table. Which one should I take off the table? Adding the two. So it's really 300 or million or a, or a billion. Which one should I use as my value for the company? Under what conditions would I use billion as the value for the company? What's the, see, what's the danger of my valuing the company in a billion, buying the shares because they look cheap? What am I most exposed to? I don't run the company. The family that runs this company could be in complete denial. They love the company so much they could keep it running as a textile company for eternity, in which case I've overpaid. We've already started to lay the foundation for the value of control, right? Because if you can buy this company and control its destiny, you can pay up to a billion. But if you're a passive investor buying shares in the company, you don't have to put it at 300 million, but you have to come up with some assessment of the likelihood that this company will stay as is, in which case the value is 300 million, or be sold for real estate, which means you've got to come up with an expected I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but this is something we face all the time, and especially with retail companies now. This is, I think, becoming an issue front and center. Because when Sears was acquired by Eddie Lampert, or Eddie Lampert got control, one of the reasons he got control was he felt he could convert the real estate under the company into more value. It's a, it's a tough challenge, but it's a challenge you've got to kind of confront these companies because that's how they're being priced. Yeah. How do we value the, the location, the advantage of locations that these companies have? It's already in there, right? As, as retail companies, what's the advantage of having that 59th Street and Lex location to Bloomingdale's? Okay. Sales. You've, you've got a subway coming out right, it's easy, it's convenient. So you're on 1st and 73rd, you'd probably not get as many people. So you don't have to add anything special for location as a retail company. Right? As a piece of real estate, that's a different business, right? You're not selling it as a, as a, as a, for a retail, it could be for anybody else. 
So let's, uh, Paul, when we start off next session, we will start off with the issue of complexity. In fact, you know, somebody suggested, why not run the place? The problem is these guys, you know, to a family run business, they're running an autopilot. There's a, seven, there's, a, there's a family disconnect that they can't get through. Uh, the families have war with each other, there are multiple generations fighting each other. Any act to yeah. sell the Mumbai property would trigger war among the family members. So it's, 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 really it's a very, very, they're very dysfunctional businesses from that perspective where everybody can see the right thing to do but they're kind of frozen in family quarrels that nobody can take a step without being sued by everybody else so basically it's a like you hear like two situations one where they already taken the decision to do that yeah. or the one that like probably they will never that's why i'm saying it's a probability driven thing so maybe you'd look at a 78 year old and say look he's going to die when he dies they have to pay taxes they have to pay taxes they have to do something and when that something happens they will be forced to do it so it'll give you a sense of probability from which you will attach but it's not going to be either a billion or 300 million it's going to be some number in the middle because the textile business itself is not the issue. It's not that they want to, it's just that there is this internal family dynamic that makes them almost dysfunctional the way they run these businesses. Yeah. I've spoken to a lot of Asian businesses, they're more, now more real estate than whatever their original business. They're more real estate than textile, more real estate than retail. You know. And it's getting interesting because the market's pricing them at 